The ancient and esoteric order of the Jackalope is a secret society devoted to a simple idea. That which is least known is best to know. Each episode, one of our initiates finds some strange story or amazing fact to share with you. No topic is off limits, except for the obvious. Oh crap, we're rolling. Uh, where'd I put those promos tapes? As kids, we were a blank sheet of paper with no life experience. And now we are paper balls full of perfect imperfections. Join me on the Grown Up Podcast as I explore these imperfections with you and occasional guests to give a different perspective on life that will make you think just a little deeper. Along the way, we celebrate independence by catching the waves of independent musicians with the Now segment, better known as Naturally on a Wave. If you're ready to smooth your imperfections so you can show up for yourself, then search Grown Up, look for the perfect and perfect paper ball and press play tune into the grown-up podcast on apple Podcasts, spotify pandora iHeartRadio, and more oh yeah remember to subscribe so you'll never miss an episode um, hey hey there initiates uh this episode is being released in mid-december in the middle of what i like to call the holiday death spot uh these weeks between thanksgiving and new year's day are traditionally the worst time of the year for the order it does not matter how well-researched or well-written or timely an episode may be. If it's coming out in December, it's going to do bad. You know what? I'm fine with that. You know what? More than fine. In fact, this year I'm leaning into it. If no one's going to download this episode, I am going to devote it to a topic that couldn't possibly be of interest to anyone other than me. Enjoy. Armor Class 4, presented by Number 13. It should not surprise long-time listeners that I play Dungeons & Dragons. Actually, scratch that. I love Dungeons & Dragons, and I have ever since the day Alex Alopolis shoved some polyhedral dice into my hand and then tricked me into kissing a Medusa. I'm an old-school nerd who remembers when, if you were lucky, the new issue of Dragon Magazine would have installments of both Wormy and Snarf Quest in the back. I have forced players to use the weapon speed rules and weapon versus armor class modifiers from the player's handbook, and then rewarded them for their trouble by handing out the laser pistols and dynamite buried in the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide like they were candy. I have played a jester for more than one session. Zaggy Garagnern is my god, and E. Gary Gygax is his prophet. Of course, if you love something, you have to love it warts and all. Dungeons and Dragons has a lot of warts. So, very many warts. Today, we're going to talk about Armor Class. If you've never played a role-playing game before, Armor Class is an abstraction that describes not only how hard you are to hit, but how often an attack will penetrate your armor and do damage. In the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, Armor Class is a number ranging from 10 to negative 10, with 10 representing a regular person wearing street clothes, and negative 10 representing a Sherman tank made out of Admantium. There's a handy little table on page 36 of the player's handbook that tells you just how much protection each type of armor provides. Armor class 10 is no armor at all. Armor class 9 is only a shield. Armor class 8 is leather armor. Armor class 7 is studded leather armor or ring mail. Armor class 6 is scale mail. Armor class 5 is chain mail. Armor class 4 is splint mail or banded mail. Armor class 3 is plate mail. And anything lower than that involves using armor and a shield or magic or possibly both. At this point, anyone who's ever made a study of historical arms and armor is champing at the bit to bust out the old um, actually, because D&D creator E. Gary Gygax had picked up several bad habits from the out-of-date materials available to him at the time. Here's a perfect example. Gygax calls all metal armor male, even though male specifically means armor is made out of tiny interlinked chains or rings. That also makes the term chain mail redundant, but we tend to let that one slide because it's become so ubiquitous. Pedantry aside, there's also some weird doubling up happening on that list. For instance, armor class 7 is provided by both studded leather armor and ring mail. This seeming redundancy can be explained when you look at other game mechanics. Some characters can only wear leather armor. There are monsters and spells which affect leather armor but not metal armor and vice versa and ring mail is considerably more expensive and heavier than leather armor. So someone shooting for armor class 7 has to weigh the various trade-offs. Do I go with the cheap leather armor that might be dissolved right off my back by a puddle of green slime? Do I go with the expensive ring mail that will drag me to my doom when I get knocked into a water-filled pit? There's a, another redundancy further down at armor class 4, 
uh, but this one's a little harder to explain. Banded male and splint male are both metal, and there is no type of character which can wear one but not the other. To make matters worse, banded male is clearly superior to splint male in almost every way, because it weighs less and allows freedom of movement. Its only downside is that it costs twice as much, which isn't nothing, but is a meaningless distinction for anyone other than a brand new character. So why are they both on the list? Maybe we could figure it out if we read the descriptions of banded male and splint male. In a typical move for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, the armor descriptions are not in the equipment section of the player's handbook where they might actually be useful, but are instead buried somewhere in the bloated mess that is the Dungeon Master's Guide. Let's see, armor, armor... Ha! Ah, yeah, here, right where it should be, on page 27, sandwiched between the reputed properties of magical gemstones and how much it costs to hire a torchbearer for a week. Banded Mail is a layered armor with padding, light chain, and a series of overlapping bands of armor in vulnerable areas. Weight is somewhat distributed. Splint Mail consists of a light chain, greaves, and a leather coat into which are laminated vertical pieces of plate with shoulder guards. So, a chain shirt of some sort, a leather or padded undershirt, and reinforcement provided by patches of metal bands. They sound pretty identical to me. If we're going to get to the bottom of this, we're going to have to look somewhere else. Maybe we should start with the sort of sources E. Gary Gygax would have had on hand, scholarly books on arms and armor from the 19th century, which he has conveniently enumerated in an appendix. What do they have to say? Splint or splinted mail seems to have been scale armor or mail with additional limb protection provided by long metal strips riveted or linked to the base. Metal pinstripes, basically. That explains why Gygax thinks it will be cumbersome and slow. Banded mail, though... Well, the sources are a bit more confused there. The usual body armor of the knightly order was, in the early part of the 13th century, of interlinked chainmail, but in the second half of the century, portions of plate appear in the form of shoulder pieces, elbow pieces, and knee pieces, and at the close of the century, a kind of armor which has been named banded mail, but of which the structure has not been exactly ascertained. Both the knight and the ordinary soldier appeared in it, and it is represented constantly in illustrations of the period and occurs on many brasses and effigies, and yet at the present time we are ignorant of its nature. No actual specimens of this defense have been preserved to the present Holmes time. legs and body were encased in an interlinked chain armor under which it was essential to wear thick padded garments, and often this mail was made more rigid and less pliable by the addition of leather, which has come to be known as banded mail, a fabric which has puzzled all antiquaries for nearly a century without reaching a satisfactory On explanation. On many subjects of perplexity to the student of ancient armor, there is none so puzzling as that of banded mail, and yet the representations of it are in the utmost abundant. By many writers, it has been described as purpointery. By others, this peculiar work has been considered only as a conventional mode of representing the ordinary chain mail. The big problem appears to be that no one has ever seen a suit of banded mail in real life. That isn't terribly surprising. A good suit of armor is too useful to lie moldering in a nobleman's grave. When it does get used, it tends to get extensively damaged. And when it's no longer useful, it gets melted down so the metal can be recycled. We'll just have to figure out what banded mail is from what we do have which are illustrations. They seem to depict suits of armor made from thick, horizontal bands of semicircles in alternating directions, usually with a line between them. The material seems to be flexible and cloth-like, hugging the body tight in some areas and draping and folding in others. The illustrations give us no clues as to how this armor is supposed to be constructed, so antiquarians have had to make educated guesses, or perhaps more to the point, uneducated guesses. One idea was that banded mail was a form of piecemeal plate armor, similar to the Roman lorica segmentata, which sounds good except for the fact that that's not what the illustrations depict at all. Another idea was that banded mail consisted of hammered metal discs attached to a quilted gambeson or leather coat. It is not clear why this would be better than, say, a suit of plate. The overlapping discs waste a lot of precious material, are extremely heavy, and not terribly flexible. The illustrations also show the discs or rings on the reverse of the armor, implying that it wasn't just single-sided. One popular suggestion was that banded mail was mail with thin leather thongs drawn through the links in alternating directions to create a distinctive pattern. If that makes some sense, a similar technique was often used to stiffen the colors and cuffs of mail shirts and coats. You wouldn't want to make an entire suit of armor that way, though, because it would be too stiff to move in. Some non-European armors, like the Persian Begter or the Russian Bekterets, do use a similar method, but they are not horizontal bands of rings, but vertical strips of plates hanging loosely. 
There's also the problem that it looks utterly ridiculous. A few modern armorers have created banded mail using this method, and it makes the wearer look bloated and puffy, like Ralphie's brother in A Christmas Story, or that the wearer is trying to LARP as the Michelin Man. It would also be ridiculously expensive to make, and almost impossible to maintain. The most popular suggestion, though, was that banded mail never existed at all, that it was a shorthand for artists and illustrators. As someone who prefers to think of himself as an artist, this makes perfect sense to me. Who wants to go mad and develop carpal tunnel from drawing something like a male shirt with a complicated and repetitive pattern? George, George Perez, maybe. But the rest of us? We're going to break that complicated pattern down into some suggestive brush scrumblings, or a series of simple loops, or alternating rows of semicircles. Of course, that then raises the question of why banded mail exists as a classification at all. Surely no one would be so stupid as to mistake artistic shorthand for actual reality. I mean... Who could look at something hyper-stylized like the Bayou Tapestry and conclude it was supposed to be a 100% accurate, literal representation of period arms and armor, right? Right? Let me introduce you to antiquarian Samuel Rush Myrick. His 1824 book, A Critical Inquiry into Ancient Armor as it Existed in Europe, but particularly in England, from the Norman Conquest to the reign of King Charles II with a glossary of military terms of the Middle Ages... <gasps> was one of the first serious attempts to study and classify medieval arms and armor, and was hugely influential. The problem was that while working alone, Myrick had fallen deep into the chasm of his own insane troll logic, and became convinced that illustrations with different types of patterning were different types of armor. The set of armor is drawn with cross-hatching at a right angle, and the set of armor is drawn with cross-hatching at an oblique angle? Why, they must be two different types of armor. This coat of mail is drawn with tiny rings, and this one with big rings? Two different types of armor. Myrick's books are filled with spurious classifications like masseled mail, lozenge-shaped metal plates sewn to a leather coat, trellised mail, square plates inserted between layers of leather and riveted into place, rustred mail, made of overlapping but not interlocking rings, and tegulated mail, metal plates hung in a pattern that resembles a child's drawing of a brick wall. None of these types of armors existed outside of Myrick's own fevered imagination. Banded mail was another one of his discoveries. That would seem to end the debate right there, no? Clearly the lazy artist theory wins. QED. Except... Antiquarians like Charles Folks raise one troubling issue. If banded mail is just a visual shorthand for chain mail, why are illustrations of banded mail often paired with more conventional depictions of chain mail? It's true. Images of knights and soldiers wearing coats of banded mail often show them wearing normal-looking mail hoods and cowls. If you're taking shortcuts... Why would you mix and match patterns like that? The argument creates just enough doubt that you can't call the matter settled. In the end, the answer to the question, what is banded mail, winds up being, we don't know, but probably nothing. So let's get back to our original question. What does this mean for Dungeons and Dragons? In 1987, Alan Ristow wrote a letter to Dragon Magazine outlining the history of banded mail and suggesting that it be removed from the game for the sake of historical accuracy. Or, if that wasn't feasible, tweaking banded mail and split mail so that there were meaningful differences between them. Ristow's letter started a kerfuffle in the Dungeons & Dragons fan community. Well, what passed for a kerfuffle in those days before the internet. For several years, the topic was vigorously debated in letters pages and fanzines. A small group of writers argued that removing banded mail from the game meant that you were no longer using the rules as written and therefore not playing real D&D. We all know those types. Many more responded that the first group were joyless grognards and argued that you should be free to do whatever you wanted in your games. Some agreed with Ristow that historical accuracy was important, and others quite reasonably pointed out that historical accuracy was a weird hill to die on when you are playing a game where elf wizards and dwarf warriors use magic swords and lightning bolts to fight demons, devils, dragons, and drow. TSR, the publisher of Dungeons & Dragons, eventually decided to deal with the debate by ignoring it. The editors of Dragon Magazine added banded mail to their list of prohibited topics, putting it in the rarefied company of what would happen if you turn someone into a worm, cut them in half, let both halves regrow, then change them back, here's how my character took down the ultra-powerful wizard Waldorf, and do female dwarves have beards? Two years later, the second edition of Dungeons & Dragons made no significant changes to the armor rules. A decade after that, the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons made major changes to the rules of the game. The new armor rules had more fiddly bits, like maximum dexterity bonus, and armor check penalty, and arcane spell failure chance, that 
could be used to differentiate banded mail and splint mail. The designers rather pointedly chose not to do that, and once again banded mail was superior to splint mail in every way, save for a trivial difference in price. At least they finally cleared up a lot of confusion as to what banded mail was supposed to be with the following expanded description. This suit includes gauntlets. There was also an accompanying illustration, which bore absolutely no resemblance to historical depictions of banded mail. I myself tend to prefer the approach taken in the 4th and 5th editions of Dungeons & Dragons. They just got rid of banded mail entirely. Gone. Poof. No replacement necessary, because there were still plenty of other armor options if you wanted some variety. You know what? There was no controversy. Nobody missed banded mail at all, because it's impossible to miss something that never existed in the first place. Key sources for this episode include Charles Henry Ashdown's Armor and Weapons in the Middle Ages, Charles John Folk's The Armorer and His Craft from the 11th to the 16th century, John Hewitt's Ancient Armor and Weapons in Europe from the Iron Period of the Northern Nations to the end of the 17th century, the Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook for 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th editions, and contemporary issues of Dragon Magazine. Connections! For more Tales of Dungeons and or Dragons, be sure to check out the Tale of Waldorf, the wizard who invented the nuclear bomb, from the episode Grandiose but Straightforward, and the history of the utterly useless 30-sided die, from the die of tomorrow, today. That's all for now, Initiates. We're heading home for the holidays, and we'll be back on New Year's Day, so you can nurse your hangover while listening to a thrilling new episode we're calling Dangerous Excitement. Until then, quiquid minime skiant, optime skire. This episode was produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalow, and that's not canon productions. A transcript, list of sources, links, and more can be found on our website, orderofthejackalope.com. That's orderofthejackalope.com, with hyphens between the words. Our show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All rights reserved, all wrongs reversed. Our theme song is Drama D by Scott Roosh. Do you have thoughts about this episode? Why not share them on our Discord server? There's a link in the show notes. Or reach out to us on social media. We can be found at Order Jackalope on most platforms. Or just send us an old-fashioned email at jackalope at orderofthejackalope.com. We want you to join our secret society. All you have to do is share your strange story or amazing fact with the world. Visit our website and click join us for more information. Until next time, Quiquid minime skiant, optime skire. That's not kind of productions podcast.